Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Tim Bratz. Thanks for being on the show, Tim. Whitney, excited to be here, brother. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure to meet meet you in Tampa a while back. Pleasure to share the same stage as well. I was honored honored to be uh, you know speaking on the same stage as somebody like yourself. And no, I appreciate and, uh, it, man. But likewise, yeah, Tim is the CEO and founder of CLE Turnkey Real Estate, a real estate investment company that acquires and transforms distressed apartment buildings into high yield assets for their own portfolio. He's built a passive business through real estate and created a residential income. Uh, that allows him to live the lifestyle of his choice. He's here to educate and empower others to become financially free through commercial real estate. He has a $180 million portfolio consisting of over 2000 rental units. Tim, thanks again for your time today and being on the show and, but give the listeners a little more about who you are and, and what your focus is right now in real estate. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate you again for having me. Appreciate all the value that you bring to the table, buddy. So, um, no, I mean, I, I'm 33 years old, went through, college when the market was going gangbusters last time. So 03 to 07, got involved with real estate. People said, hey, if you want to make money, get involved in real estate. And that's kind of what motivated a 21-year-old kid back then. And so I, my brother lived out in New York City. I went out there and I became a commercial real estate agent, you know, representing uh, landlords and businesses, finding, finding spots. And so I brokered my first deal, my first, my first lease out there that was uh, 400 square feet. And we signed a $10,000 a month lease agreement on 400 square feet with a 4% annual escalation and a 12 year term and realized pretty quickly I was on the wrong side of the coin. I needed to be owning rental property instead of brokering it. And so, uh, you know, you start reading all those books on personal development, and real estate, and all these different things and realize that I really love the concept of residual income and doing something one time and then getting paid on it over and over and over again. And, uh, and then obviously passive income, uh, doing something and, and being really hands off and having either a business that was passive or an asset that, that passively created income on a, on a regular basis. And so um, I love that, but I think a lot of us get into real estate for that allure. And then we kind of get jammed up and stuck in that rat race of uh, transactional deals, right? So we go start flipping houses or wholesaling houses. I had a, I was doing a lot of that, got involved in like the turnkey business where I'd buy a single family house, fix it up, package it with a tenant management and then sell it off to uh, um, somebody who just, you know, wanted to own real estate passively. And um, a couple of years ago, about 18 months ago, looked at my portfolio, where was I making my money and where was I spending my time? And 90% of my wealth came from my apartment buildings that I was pretty much passively invested in. And um, it was about 10% of my time. And so I, I pivoted my entire residential investment team into apartments. And um, we went from about 400 units a couple of years ago to we're at tw a little over 2,100 units today. Nice. Nice. So, yeah, I hear it so so often about you know people that get into real estate and they they develop a flipping business or um, you know something like wholesaling, but they're still they're just creating another job, you know. And so uh, eventually, that seems they get into multifamily, and then they're like, "Why didn't I start this a long time ago?" Yeah, uh, you know. So tell me a little bit about you know you realize that that would you say like your your um, you were making the your wealth was coming from your passive investments in multifamily? Is that right? Yeah, my, my majority of my wealth was being created in my my holdings versus the tr this transactional. You mm -hmm. know, if I went and sold something, yeah, I'd keep the lights on, put some food on the table, but I'd have to go do it again in order to get paid again. And the reality is majority of my wealth, and maybe, some, you know, I mean, we're in real estate, right? So some of that is actual cash that was coming in from these. And some of it was an equity in the project itself. Uh, but the reality is my net worth, uh, what, what, made, what was making me wealthy was all from uh, my apartment building portfolio. So that's really where majority of the, the net worth came from. And that's where I wanted to focus on. You know, it's like the transactional stuff is, is cool. You can have a good lifestyle. Um, you can get rich doing that, but you can't build wealth doing that. Yeah, you mentioned that. And that was actually the, the thing that was taking the least amount of your time. 
Exactly. You know, I, I raised some equity and raised some capital for uh, some joint venture partners and helped kind of sponsor some of those loans and got involved in some other, some of my own projects as well. Um, I'm out of Cleveland, Ohio, but I invest in South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Texas, Oklahoma, and a couple other areas. Um, and so, you know, I, I just took a look at kind of what were we doing and I, I pivoted my team. I took my residential team and I took my acquisitions guy and told him to stop looking at houses and only look, only look at apartment buildings. You know, I took my project manager, instead of renovating houses, we're going to only renovate apartments. And my, my dispositions guy who was selling our houses said, instead of selling houses, you're going to be uh, managing the management company, managing our assets. And so it, it was, it was a big mindset shift, but it was really only a minor pivot for my business itself. And it's a, mm -hmm. uh, it's catapulted us. It's, it's been, you know, a quantum leap of where we were uh, just, you know, 24 months ago to where we are today and the opportunities that are coming up. You know, I mean, I have, I'm at 2,100 units and I have another 1,100 under contract right now. And I, we just got a, a signed LOI on another 360 unit. I'm looking at 500 uh, unit portfolio. So um, it's pretty remarkable you know, when you make that sort of commitment to the universe, how the universe responds and, uh, and says, Hey, you know, I want to, I want to, uh, encourage you and, and reward you for drawing a line in the sand and burning the ships. I think it's interesting how, how you said, uh, you mentioned that it was a small shift, you know, where, where to me, it sounded, I mean, it sounded like, you know, you all had a business, you had these systems in place. And then all of a sudden you said, yeah, you know, we're, we're cutting this off. We're shifting. We're doing this over here now. To me, that would yeah. seem like a big deal, you know, when you're this many, you know, other people uh, that are involved and other employees. And, uh, but, but, you know, I, I like the mindset of where you said, no, it was just a small shift. And now we're, we're taking off in a new direction. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, it's good. It's been great. It's been phenomenal. I, I wish I would have done it sooner, you know? Yeah. <coughs> so, excuse me. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd like for you to explain a little bit about how you are syndicating deals and because uh, it's different than any model that I've heard before or, or any guests that I've had on the show even. So, you know, I'd love to know a little bit more about how you're structuring these deals and, and just your syndication process and business. Yeah. So uh, my, my model's a little bit different. Um, I, I'm so I've, first of all, I've never been to a course or a seminar or read a book or anything before I came up with this. Um, um, I'm friends with some of the big syndicators in, in the country now and uh, have met them through some different networking panels and discussions and things like that. But I just kind of came up with this on my own um, through, I don't even know. I was just like, it, what made, it's what made sense for my investors, what made sense for me and the different types of projects that we were investing in. So um, I call it Bratz syndication. So it's going to be a thing. I'm trying to get into Wikipedia. <laughs> That's awesome. But, but what, what I do is, I look for value add properties and, and this, this all stemmed out of the residential realm. I'm a residential guy by, you know, uh, how I got started. And what we would do in the residential realm is you try to find a house that you can buy and renovate withholding costs and be all in for 65% of the stabilized value. Right? So I just figured when I'm buying apartment buildings, why don't I follow that same method? And I see a lot of people in commercial real estate buying things at kind of like retail prices. And for me, that never made sense. I'm always an investor. I'm always looking for a discount at a wholesale price. And so for me, I only buy apartment buildings where I can be all in, you know, instead of talking about a house that's worth hundred grand, you gotta be all in for $65,000. I'm looking at $10 million building. I need to be all in for $6.5 million. So how do you get those kinds of deals? One, you gotta find usually distressed assets, right? It's usually physically distressed or from a management perspective, distressed or just a motivated seller in some capacity. And we're able to come in, buy those, renovate them, force that appreciation by, by all the sweat equity that we put into these things. And because we can force the appreciation so much in a very short period of time, I turn around and refinance my properties in 12 to 18 months on average. So I buy it, you know, renovate it, stabilize it with good tenants and good management. And then we turn around and, and slap long-term debt on it. So we go and get an agency loan at 75%. So on a $10 million deal, they'll give me seven and a half million bucks. That allows me to pay off my equity investors and my bridge loan, my construction loan of $6.5 million, my all in price. And then it leaves me with a, a spread of a million dollars of non-taxable refinance proceeds. So because I'm able to get my investors out that quickly um, and because I can stabilize a property in a very predictable amount of time, I'm able to then project how much I'm going to spend on 
debt service if I pay them as if it's either a debt or you know a fixed pref. So I pay, I pay my investors a 10% pref and I know that if I'm gonna borrow 1.5 million bucks over the course of 12 months, it's gonna cost me 150 grand. I just add that into the basis of my property. So I buy it, renovate it, you know, I'm, I'm making payments regardless of the property's performance to my investors. Uh, so my investors are happy because they know that they could see the money coming in on a quarterly basis into their bank account. And then when I turn around and refinance, I keep 90% of the deal and I pay 10% of the equity to my investors in perpetuity. So they made a good return on their investment while it was in play for 12, 18 months. And then they get all their money back and they get 10% of the refi proceeds. So another hundred grand. So that, that boosts their IRR to closer to like, I don't know, what is that? Like 20, 25% almost. Then they get 10% of all the, all the cash flow in perpetuity and 10% of any future sales proceeds. And then they come right back to me and they say, hey, Tim, let's roll it into another deal. And I'm able to give them a little bit more velocity on their capital than they can in a traditional syndicate. So it allows me um, to not have to raise money every five years. It, like it, I can raise money one time and rotate through that same amount of equity every 24 months you know, and get, use the same equity investors in many more deals and I can take down more deals because of it. Now it's a lot more work on my, t on my team and, uh, and on me because we're taking on these, these heavier value adds. Um, but for, you know, our background and our risk tolerance and our, uh, our business acumen and our project management, what, what we, what our skill sets and our unique abilities are, it makes a lot of sense for that. Now you gotta have, you gotta one, find awesome deals, most of our deals are off market, direct to seller deals. We very rarely buy through brokers. Um, number two is you gotta have badass property management in place. You gotta have some, and project management, I'm sorry, in place. People who know how to renovate a property and run crews. I mean, I have, I have one deal going down right now that um, we're spending $10 million in CapEx over the course of about 15 months. Wow. And so it's, you're talking about, what is that, seven, $800,000 a month that we're, we're putting in, or about six, $700,000 a month that we're putting into these things. And that's just one of my projects. So there's a lot of heavy value add in there, um, but it makes sense. You know, I don't take an acquisition fee. I don't take any sort of asset management fee. I only get paid when the property refinances. And when the property refinances, that's when our investors get all their money back. So now we're in the same boat, rowing in the same direction and uh, visions and goals are aligned. I think traditional syndication, you know, not taking away from anybody who traditionally syndicates, but I think traditional syndication, uh, there's incongruent uh, goals and, and you know, uh, ob objectives uh, for both the syndicator and the, um, uh, and the investor. So I think the way that I've kind of framed it has really worked well for what I'm doing and, um, and my investors seem to love it too. So it sounds like you were able to take, you know, what you were doing on a turnkey level with single family and really amp it up to doing multifamily. Uh, but I mean, grow into the syndication business, but kind of keep almost the same model a little bit, uh, but yep. at a much larger scale. And so yep. you're doing, you know, so you, your plan is to, you know, flip these properties every 18 to 24 months, but then you, you continue to hold them, correct? Yeah, we, we hold. I, I don't I don't sell anything. Again, I see a lot of syndicators who have the, the idea of exiting a property in three, five, seven years. And for me, I'm, uh, that's just, that's transactional income, right? That's transact. That's a job. You got to go do it again now in order to, for me, I want to build legacy wealth. You know, I want to do something once and we, we put so much work into it on the front end. Why would you ever want to sell that in 24 months? Like, I, I don't want to do that. I'd rather refinance it, take just as much money off the table tax-free anyways. Um, and then sit on this thing for the next 10, 12 years, 10, 12 years from now, I'll make a decision on where the market is, where the economy is, what's going on with that property itself. But I could probably just refinance again, pull out more tax-free money and sit on this thing for another 10 years because I've, I've already done all the, all the big fixes, right? I've already done the roof, the windows, the electric, the plumbing, the parking lot, all those 20, 25 year, 30 year fixes have already been done. So I have some options. And, and we, it, it creates very predictable cash flow for us as well once these things are stabilized. So how are you able to manage, you know, such large rehabs in so many different places all over the country? Good question. I, I have a lot of joint venture partners. So now that there's more juice in the squeeze for the operator, 
on these deals. You know, I have a team up in Cleveland, Ohio. So I, I typically own 75, 80%, 90% of my deals in Cleveland because my, my team is up here and can handle all that stuff. Anything that's in South Carolina or Georgia or Texas or Oklahoma, I have joint venture partners in those markets and they get a piece of the equity as well just for overseeing the project management and kind of being our boots on the ground. So it's cool for them um, where they can have a, a, a good chunk of the, of the deal um, without having to worry about sponsoring the loan or raising the equity or some of these other things. Uh, you know, I see a lot of syndicators, they think they have to be Superman or Wonder Woman and, and be able to do every aspect of the deal. And the way that I've structured it has, has really allowed me to focus on my unique ability, which is raising equity and then partner up with people who are phenomenal uh, project managers, property managers, uh, deal sourcers, and I can pay them better than what anybody else in the industry can pay them because of the way that I structure my projects. Can you give us a couple of pointers on, on how you're able to find so many great deals uh, off market, direct to seller? Yeah. So the same way I found deals on the, in the residential realm, you know, I mean, I mean, you can do a couple of things. One, you can drive for dollars, you know, it's get in your car, drive around, just like there's houses with boarded up windows and tall grass. There's buildings with boarded up windows and tall grass. Um, you can also dial for dollars. So instead of calling for sale by owners, you can call for, uh, for, or for sale by owners in the residential realm. You can call for sale by owners in the commercial realm. We also call for rent by owners. So we're calling them and saying, Hey, we're not interested in renting your property, but we're interested in potentially buying it. Do you have any interest in selling? Um, <clears throat> you know, building relationships with property management companies and all sorts of vendors too. Our vendors send us a lot of deals. So our exterminator knows all the, you know, uh, bug ridden properties all around town. Um, our coin operated laundry service provider knows all the different landlords and has, has introed us to a bunch of different people. Uh, you know, you can do direct mail just like you do in the residential realm. Like you see these postcards and stuff going around. Um, there, there's a whole bunch of different ideas and strategies and it's just getting out there. It's doing the stuff that other people aren't willing to do in order to find the deals that other people can't find. And it's helpful to have those, the JV partners in those areas. I'm sure that, you know, they can be drive, doing the drive bys and looking for property. And that, and that's the other thing, you know, because I, because I can give them, you know, three, five, 10% of the deal, even just for finding it without even having to do anything. Um, you know, I can give them a little piece of the equity in the project and there's enough juice in the squeeze again for them where now they can send over deals. And I have this army of people who are always looking for opportunities for us. I know you said raising equity was one of your specialties and what are a couple of things that's really worked well or really helped you boost your equity raising portion side of your business? Um, I, I, it's, it's more of a mental thing than anything else. You know, I mean, a lot of people want to know like what, what's the, the tactical strategy for me, it was more of a mindset shift. So, uh, looking at it from an investor standpoint, an investor standpoint, what are investors looking at when you, when you present a deal? Well, one is the asset, probably the least important of these three things, but, uh, number one is the asset. Where is it? What kind of asset is it? Is it performing, not performing, you know, all, all that stuff. Okay, great. Number two is the return. Okay. That's, that's important. Is the reward worth the risk, um, of, of investing in this project? What other types of investments are available comparative to this? Could I could leave the money in the stock market. I can invest in this project. I can invest in a real estate trust. I can invest in, so you have to make it more juicy than a lot of those other investments, uh, but also have um, a lower perceived risk, right? So the, uh, the return is number two. The number three, which is the most important of all these things that investors asking themselves when they're looking at a deal that you're presenting is, is about the character of the borrower. They're asking themselves, does this person have the fortitude to repay me my money? And if you're not conveying a conviction that you will go and work third shift at, at Taco Bell, should the economy fall apart and markets shift and everything crumble just to make sure that they make their money back. If you are not conveying that sort of a message to your investors, you're probably gonna have a tough time raising capital. Right? So that was a big, a big shift. And the other thing is, you know, some people say, Hey, go find the deal and then you'll raise the money. Other people say, go raise the money and then go look for a deal. For me, I'm always doing both of those things. I think those are the two most important things you can be doing at any given time is always looking for deals always looking for money. 
Sometimes there's a lot of money. Sometimes there's a lot of deals. Very rarely do you have both of those at the same time though, right? So, um, so I'm always planting seeds, looking for opportunities, looking for deals, and I'm always planting seeds. Every conversation, I'm very intentional about talking to people um, about uh, you know their their opportunities to invest and you know raise money for for projects and partner up on projects and come in as an equity investor in projects. And when you don't need the money, is the easiest time to raise the money, right? You've heard that before. But I see a lot of people who like, go this 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 hunting strategy and raising private money. And when you hunt, you know what happens to the prey? The prey runs away, right? So you don't want a hunting mentality. You want a, a fishing mentality. So you put the lure in the water, let people know what you do, how you do it, how they can get paid, how they can participate, how they can partner up, what the tax benefits are, all those different things. It's more of an educational piece and just putting all those lures in the water. And eventually when the timing's right, somebody will bite. And they'll be like, hey, you still doing that? I'm interested. I just sold my business. I just launched my product. I just sold this other property. I'm interested in investing. I just moved my 401k and you know, I, I put in a self-directed uh, vehicle and blah, blah, blah. And so it's, it's a lot about timing. It's, it's, it's less about um, you know, what you say and how you say it. It's more about timing. And, and then again, having that conviction that, that you will get them their money back regardless of what happens to the economy. So that's um, uh, some of the shifts that I've been making and some of the things that we've done in order to really, you know, be able to posture up with our investors and talk with them and educate them and let them know uh, what we have available. Are you a new or sophisticated investor wanting to learn how to operate a successful syndication business? For life-changing training from the nation's leading syndication expert, my friend Vinny Chopra has the training you need. Text LEARN, L-E-A-R-N, to 474747. No, that's awesome. And, you know, tell us your, uh, like buying criteria, you know, like, you know, if you're looking for a property, what are, what is it, what are the things that has to meet? Yeah. So, uh, I buy, I buy in A and B class areas only. So I used to, you know, obviously when you're growing and you're getting started, uh, you need to get enough assets in your portfolio to really build your balance sheet. So sometimes we go into C class kind of areas. Um, I don't go into C class areas. I only buy A and B class areas, but I'll buy a C class building or a D class building even, or we even do new construction in some of those areas. I don't do luxury. Um, I stay in A, A and B class areas, but it's workforce housing. When the economy's good, everybody can afford that. When the economy shifts, all those luxury renters move into more workforce type housing. And so that's, that's my bread and butter. That's the only thing that we invest in. Um, and really apartment buildings is the only thing, the only asset class we invest in also. Um, I own some, some office buildings and stuff too, but I'm not actively growing that or looking at any other asset classes, just apartments right now. Um, we, we usually, if it's in Cleveland, Ohio, which is where I am, we'll buy anything that's 10 units or bigger. We own a management company. We'll do um, any size property up here. Uh, if it's out of state, we typically want it about 75 units or bigger. That allows us to put on-site property managers and on-site staff, personnel, all that kind of stuff. Um, and, then, and then our stabilized cap rate, we have to be all in at a stabilized cap uh, at our cost basis needs to be at least 10%. And a lot of people are like, what? How are you finding a, you know, 10% cap rates in A and B class areas? Um, you know, you're better off finding a unicorn and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Here's the thing. I have 2,100 units. Every single one of them is between a 10 to 17% cap rate at my cost basis. And I've acquired all of them in the past 42 months, three and a half years. So it gives you an idea. I promise you there's deals out there. A lot of people tell themselves these stories that there's no deals out there. The reality is there's deals all over the place. The problem is you're talking to brokers and as much as, you know, I, I, I appreciate and respect brokers. You have to understand their mindset. A broker doesn't have to put a property on the market. They can sit on a, on a pocket listing for as long as they want. And so that way they can earn both sides of the commission. So that broker knows the top 20 buyers in town. They're shopping it to the top 20 buyers in town. The property doesn't hit the market on LoopNet or the MLS or whatever until the top 20 buyers in town all said no to it. So you have to understand the stuff that you're seeing, if you're, if you're working only through broker relationships are usually junk deals 
that the top 20 people in town already said no to. So why would you go and, and try to buy something like that? So we don't even mess around. We usually are off market, direct to the seller. And um, uh, until you get to a point where you are one of those top 20 buyers in town, you get to see that property before anybody else does. To me, it doesn't make much sense working through a broker. So um, yeah, hopefully that helps. <laughs> no, it's good. It's good. And wh what's been the hardest part of, of the syndication business or process for you? Uh, probably uh, early on, it was, it was balancing out the money with the deal flow kind of a thing and scrambling, kind of learning. Uh, I, had, I had a deal last summer. I was raising uh, $4 million on it. And the investors, the investor was bringing money from another deal that didn't end up closing and told me the Friday before a Monday closing on my project. So I had to raise $4 million in 48 hours. I got it done, but it was, it was a learning curve and there's other things that you end up putting in place to make sure that that kind of stuff doesn't happen anymore. Um, you know, a, a lot of, probably the biggest expense to us was not doing enough due diligence on the front end, physical due diligence on these properties. Um, plumbing, you know, I'm in Cleveland, Ohio. So the average, apartment building here is a hundred years old and um, plumbing usually crumbles by that point. And we weren't scoping a lot of the lines and just some stuff like that. And then also buying in C-class areas, trying to force deals just because I had access to money and I didn't have enough deals. And so um, going back to all those things, like now we have a very dialed in due diligence process. We scope every single line. I probably spend, I don't know, $10,000 on every property before just on due, just on physical due diligence, not even talking about syndication, like putting the SEC docs together and uh, putting a purchase agreement together or anything like that. Just on the physical due diligence, it's between five to 10 grand across every single property that we, that we do. We pay contractors to come out, we pay contractors to look at roofs. We pay contractors to, you know, check the foundation. We're doing all that kind of stuff, uh, scoping every single plumbing line. So, uh, you know, you get, you get punched in the teeth enough times, you learn your lesson and uh, it's, it's kind of helped us refine that, that process. Um, and then the, uh, what was the other thing that I just said? Uh, the physical due diligence. And then what was the other thing? You're raising, uh, or, or you had to pay t you know, roughly 10,000 per time and uh, for your due yeah, diligence. So, yeah, anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, it's all good. But you know, the, a couple of those things that, um, you run through a couple of those and, and you learn your lesson and then you, you dial it in, dial it in, dial it in, make sure that um, you don't, you don't cross that bridge again. So, Oh, I know what the other thing was forcing deals. Do not force deals. Everybody wants to be a, a real estate investor. Everybody wants to buy apartment buildings. That's like the cool topic right now, you know? And, um, and everybody's trying to make the numbers work. Listen, you don't make the numbers work. The numbers are what they are. If you force a deal, you will lose money. Just because you have access to, to equity, access to capital, doesn't mean you should buy a deal. Make sure the numbers make sense. My team, my staff, my acquisitions department, I tell them to kill every single deal. If you cannot kill that deal, that means it is a deal, right? Then you move forward with it. But do not try to force a deal. You Just as much wealth as you can build in, in buying apartment buildings, it can take you out of the knees and crumble you if you do the wrong deal. No, so you got to like be careful that. in that stuff. Yeah, I like that a lot. Don't force the deal. If it doesn't work, don't don't think it's going to. Uh, you know, give us, uh, you know, before we have to go, there's a couple more key questions I want to ask you. But, you know, what's what's one thing that helped you raise $4 million in 48 hours? <laughs> a, lot, a lot of work. And um, here's here's what I learned about private money is the most likely people are to invest with you are people – who have already invested with you. Mm. Meaning if you're not all, if you're not touching your private money lenders every 30 days, talking to them, seeing what they got going on, seeing if they have more money, um, coming, letting them know about deals you have in the pipeline. Uh, those are going to be the easiest people because you've already surpassed all that major threshold, that major hurdle of, of the character of the borrower. Now they trust you. Now they respect you. You know, now they can come in and, and uh, do more deals with you. So, that was one of them. And there were, there were some people who came to the table with a significant amount of money that I only did a small deal with before, you know, like there was one guy who came to the table with 1.5 million of the $4 million. And I had only done a couple of small deals, uh, 40,000, 160,000 and a $200,000 deal. But because I did three of them, I paid him in full. I paid him on time. 
I built good rapport with them when it was time where I, when I needed them to really come to the table and, and, uh, help me out. He was able to do that. And he was willing to do that. Um, you know, just, just by having a good reputation with him. So there's a, uh, you got to build those rep. You got to build those relationships, take small loans, do some, do a lot of small deals with a lot of investors just so they, they build that comfortability with you. And, um, and when it comes time where you got to go and raise 200,000 or 500,000 for a deal, if they have the capacity to do that, they will bring it to the table just by, um, uh, having a, a prior pre-existing relationship with you. I like that relationship. So important, right? Um, but w- what's the, what's some way that you've recently improved your business that we could apply to ours? Oh man. Um, checklists for everything, you know, trying to make it so simple, uh, for everybody involved, for your investors to understand it, for your team to understand it, for your contractors to understand it, for your joint venture partners to understand it, setting proper expectations and then having checklists in place of what everybody's job is, what everybody's role is, what they're supposed to be doing on a daily, weekly, monthly um, uh, schedule. And, uh, you know, when, you, when there's checklists in place and, and metrics in place, then you can measure your business. If you cannot measure your business, you cannot manage your business. Hmm. You have to have key performance indicators in place to be sure that you can manage your business properly. So figuring out for each role of every person on your team, joint venture partners, in-house employees, all the way down to your maintenance staff, making sure you have KPIs in place for everybody and you're measuring their their uh, progress on a daily, weekly, monthly basis um, allows you to then hop on a phone call for 10 minutes every morning and say, Hey, what are your numbers? Boom, 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 boom. Great. That's good. I don't really care if they're up or down on a day by day, but I'm marking it in my book that if they're down for three, four, five, seven days in a row, now it's time to step in and say, Hey, what's going on? You know, how can we improve this? How can we get better? All that kind of stuff, you know? And if numbers are great and you guys are doing awesome, really appreciate you. Go back to hanging out with uh, my four year old, my two year old, you know? That's awesome. It allows you to act fast also, right? You know, so like by day four, day seven, you can already act and you're not waiting a month later when you actually notice this big problem. Exactly. I mean, think about, think about a month. A month is almost 10% of the year. And you, that means you lost out on 10% of the property's performance if you just wait until the end of the month when the, when the statements come out. Hmm. You've got to be looking at this stuff on a, on a daily, weekly basis or at least having somebody on your team look at it on a daily, weekly basis. You know, um, you cannot wait that long in order to, to actually take action. If you wait 30 days for the report to come out, and then it's going to be another week or two weeks until that actual the the, the uh, progress strategy and and, and uh, improvement plan is put into place. And guess what? I mean, you're you're talking about six, seven weeks down the road, and that's that's uh 15% of a year is gone. You know, so you gotta, you gotta pay attention to that stuff. You gotta be proactive, um, set very high expectations. And if they fall short, Hey, no problem because you set expectations this big. It's better than setting expectations down here and then they still fall short. Right. So what's been the number one thing that's contributed to your success, Tim? Uh, I think, I think mindset. Uh, I, I do some coaching. I teach people how to, how to scale up from, buying single family and flipping houses and and start building that, that portfolio and how to do it in a big way and uh, a lot of syndicators and stuff. And and one of the things that I always come across is people, you know, they're so fearful of like what could happen, like what could go wrong. And, and, and uh, you know, I could lose all my money. I could lose all my investors money. I could ruin my credit. I could go bankrupt. I could, uh, a contractor might burn me and property manager might, might, you know, leave in the middle of the month. And those are serious what ifs, right? Those are absolutely concerns, but I don't think they're the right what ifs of what you like. What if, what if you bought an apartment building and you got rich? What if you bought an apartment building and you got wealthy? What if you bought an apartment building or a a series of apartment buildings, a portfolio of apartment buildings, and you built a financial wall around your family that nothing could ever penetrate? What if you built legacy wealth that many, 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 many uh, people down, down the, the generational ladder can look back and say, hey, because Whitney bought a bunch of apartment buildings, great, 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 great grandpa Whitney, 
because he bought a bunch of apartment buildings, it changed our family's uh, financial tree forever, forever. And now we're able to give back and now we're able to do more. And now we're able to give more and be more and, and uh, um, make a difference in the world, make a bigger impact in the world. Like that's the stuff that I focus on. And I, 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 you know, take into account those inherent risks of actually owning assets and properties and managing these things. That's why I hire people to make sure my downside risk is minimized. Um, but I try not to think about that stuff. I hire that stuff out so that way somebody on my team is thinking about it. So that, would, that way it doesn't mess up my mind. And I'm always looking at bigger and uh, loftier goals and, and making a bigger impact and a bigger uh, um, difference in the world. So I think that's one of the things that's kind of helped set me apart. It's more of an abundance mentality than, uh, than a scarcity mentality. That's awesome. Uh, and, and how do you like to give back? Oh man. So, so obviously, you know, you can write checks and you can do that kind of stuff. But for me, I like to do, I like to kind of know the people that I'm, that I'm giving back to. So like last year, I, um, uh, when the Cavs were good last season, uh, I, I had a suite to the, the, the final or the Eastern conference finals. And I bought this suite, um, uh, to the playoffs and got to take out some business associates. That was cool. Got to take out some family. That was cool. They went to a third game and um, we had the suite and I thought, Hey, you know, I like, I could take family. I could take friends. I could take business associates, but somebody needs to like experience this that hasn't experienced this before and would never have the opportunity to experience. So I put it out on Facebook. I said, Hey, who knows somebody who's like deserving of an experience like this. And I'm looking for somebody who not only like over, who not only like faced adversity, but overcame it and then, and then found out a way to like pay it forward, make a difference, make an impact on other people's lives. And so, um, it was pretty crazy, man. I had, I had the news pick it up and, um, had over 500 people submit these, these amazing loving messages to me on social media of saying, Hey, this person deserves it. Here's the things that they face. Here's the things that they went through, blah, blah, blah. And, um, I ended up picking five families, gave me four tickets and they were usually people like one family, they lost their child to a congenital heart defect. And instead of becoming a victim, they, they started a nonprofit, right? And they're now they're helping other families with congenital heart defect children and making an impact among, amongst kids. And, um, there's another lady who's a school teacher and her husband is a, um, a local police officer and she had breast cancer and got her MBA while she was like battling breast cancer and teaching school and her husband's trying to help out with kids, like making an impact and like paying it forward and give, you know, so, um, uh, another little girl, her, her, she lost her sister to a, an accidental drug overdose. And instead of like going down a, a dark path, she ended up, um, speaking and now she goes around all these different schools in Cleveland and speaks to kids about the risks and, and these things that come with, um, you know, drugs and accidental overdoses and all these other things. And, and in order to make a difference and an impact in the world. So wow. it's, um, it's been, it's been really, really cool. Stuff like that is really rewarding for me and, um, you know, promoting people's, uh, you know, I, I had a buddy who, uh, grew up with a guy and, um, essentially his brother passed away, inherited the, the four kids his brother had. And this guy didn't make any money. You know, like he had a, a, a two bedroom house between him, his wife and their two kids. And they had to build on an addition to their house. So me, my, my, my buddy who knew him and uh, a couple other guys, we each pitched in, you know, a few thousand dollars, got him some Lowe's gift cards and Home Depot gift cards and sent some contractors out there. And, you know, for, for guys like us, wasn't a big difference didn't make a big, made a huge impact to him. Oh, right. Of course. And they were able to build an addition onto their house, take on these four foster kids. And I like, I like stuff like that where you kind of like closer to, yeah. to it than just writing a check. That's awesome, Tim. Appreciate you sharing that and, and uh, tell the listeners how they can learn more about you and, and your company. I yeah, appreciate that. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm active on, on Facebook. I put out a lot of free content on social media and on Facebook. And so, um, find me, Tim Bratz, B-R-T-Z, B-R-A-T-Z. You guys will see the show notes, I'm sure. Yes. And then um, uh, my website's uh, cleturnkey.com. You can learn more about us there. And I do some coaching. Um, commercial Empire is my, my brand and commercialempire.com. Fill out an app. My team will reach out and give you um, some insight on, on what our next events are and stuff. So it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Or, or as you can tell, I'm pretty transparent about giving as much 
content and, and value as I possibly can. And, um, again, it goes back to, I think the, the abundance mentality. Uh, a lot of people keep a lot of that stuff close to their, their chest on their secrets. And for me, it's not, it's not about that. I think if I tell and educate more people about what we do and how we do it, a lot of times they're like, Hey, how can we partner together? How can we work together? And, and, you know, I'd, I'd rather have 25% of a watermelon than hundred percent of a grape. And I think there's more juice in the squeeze of that. So it's a, uh, it's a cool way that we, that we've kind of figured out and how to do business and been able to meet and work with a lot of awesome people because of it. So appreciate you though, man. Thank you so much for having me on here and hopefully we can connect on uh, discussion panel again pretty soon. Yeah, that sounds great. Thanks again, Tim. I really appreciate just your level of expertise and just the value that you provided to the listeners today. I hope they'll reach out to you uh, and connect. I also hope they'll go to LifeBridge Capital and connect with me and also join us on our Facebook group, The Real Estate Syndication Show, so we can all learn from experts like Tim and grow our businesses together. We'll talk to each of you tomorrow. Appreciate you, buddy. Thank you for listening to The Real Estate Syndication Show, brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.